to invite you to turn to the book of Zechariah, the second last book of the Old Testament, and we're looking at chapter 3. It'll be just before Malachi. So from verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine, and under his fig tree. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to be reading from verses 1 uh, to 11. We've covered a few of these already. This morning, our focus will be on verses 9 to 11, but we'll read that section together. So follow along with me. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 11. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is God's word. Let's invite Des to come now and lead us around the Lord's table. Can I invite you to open up your Bibles back to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Now if I were to uh, hand out a, a slip of paper to each of you and and uh, get a pen in your hands and just to ask you the question uh, and to write your answer in one statement. What makes Christianity distinct from all the religions of the world? One sentence statement. I want you just just in your head for a moment to uh, visualize you have the paper in front of you. What would you put to capture uh, an answer for that question? What makes Christianity distinct from the myriad of religions in our world. 
in our passage, in the few verses that we have here in the middle of Colossians, the Holy Spirit lays out the very clear answer to that, what it is that distinguishes this faith that we have come uh, to receive and put in, in the Lord of Christianity. We find ourselves here in Colossians chapter 3, and as you just run your eyes over it, we've moved from the great theology of the letter to really now into the application of Christian living. So as you look over those verses, especially from verse 5 onwards, um, you see they're very practical for Christian living. Last week we saw uh, the Christian commands of what we shouldn't be doing. And we look at the list of sins that are mentioned there, sexual sins, sins of anger, and, and these are the things that we shouldn't be doing. And then as you move forward, as you look down you start moving into all the positive commands of what Christians should be doing. How ought we to live practically and positively? But again, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, cannot help himself. And as he's going into this sea of of application, we get these few verses here, verses 9 to 11. And he breaks up the application to again ground everything that we are to do in Christian doctrine, truth. And it's again the theology of what we believe, the reality of the gospel that causes him to kind of rise up in a tempest of of flaming passion before he again says, this is what you're supposed to do. So verses 9 and 11 to 11 here, we get like this little bridge. Don't do this. Here's how you should live, but we get this little sandwich in section just here. And then he's going to launch into more application. So before we jump in again, let's ask the Lord for his grace on our time. Our God, you have said that man is like the grass and the flower of the field. We, we wither and we fade. And we perish. We're here one day and we're gone the next but your word endures forever. Lord, we say with Peter, where else have we to go for you alone have the words of eternal life? And so, Lord, we sit at your feet even in this moment and we say, speak, Lord. Come and lead your flock to green pastures that they might be fed, all of us, speaker and hearer. And we pray that we might feed and be nourished and that we might be strengthened. Lord, as we open up your holy book, we pray that the word would come forth in mighty power as it goes in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And may you send it deep into each heart. Lord, accomplish a great work. Lord, may nothing less than your word and nothing more than your word be spoken at this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, our first, our first point is the new person. The new person. Look at verse 9. Last week we stopped uh, halfway through verse 9. Look at verse 9. He says, Do not lie to one another. Now that rounds off there. Do not lie to one another. That rounds off the two lists of sins that he says we should not be committing as Christians. You see all in verse 5, all the sexual sins. And then you see in verse 8, all the sins pertaining to anger and the mouth. And verse 9, do not lie to one another. Now, what is the basis for putting off all of this sinful behavior? Look at the rest of verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Now, you have put off the old self to remove and separate yourself from your old self. Now, the ESV translates the tense really well there. You have put off. This is something that has happened to the Christian. The Christian has put off the old self. And this is just another way of saying what he already told us in verse 3. Remember, what did he say in verse 3? You have died. You died with Christ. And now he says in verse 9, you've put off the old self. He's repeating and reinforcing. Now, what is the old self? What have we seen repeatedly? 
It is everyone. It is the offspring, the sons and daughters of Adam. Every single person born into this world. It is being under Adam, our representative. We shared in his guilt. We had a hand in the plucking of the fruit. And so now we are born sinners. It's not just that we sin. We sin because we're born sinners. This is what we receive from him. By nature, we are sinners. A bit of Bible trivia. What is the most deceitful thing in all of the world? What are the most deceitful things in the world? I'd say false teachers, demons, Satan. What does Jeremiah tell us? Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Wow, more than the devil. The thing that's inside of me. Deceitful above all things. See, we have from Adam, we have a nature problem. There's something deep within us in our being. It's not simply, we like to talk about us, you know, we're broken people and and we're flawed and we make mistakes. No, 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 it's not that we have flaws. The very citadel of our lives have been corrupted and are ruined. But when the nature is corrupted, when the root is corrupted, what happens to the fruit? What does he say in the verse, in verse 9? He says, you put off the old self with its practices. See, we had a broken and corrupt and defiled nature, but what did that lead to? Sour, rotten, filthy fruit. Practices. And and so these practices are what he's laid out, these sexual sins, anger-related sins. And so the point that he's making, humanity, we see, you know, why is there all this evil in the world? Why is there such wickedness rampant? What's going on? Well, the state of our nature determines the fruit that comes out. So all that we're seeing is a result of what's going on. On the inside, Jesus said in Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lies, and slander. There's a nature problem here. And Paul says, you didn't just put off the old nature, the old self, but you put off its practices with it. The fruit went with the tree. When the axe was laid at the root of the tree, the fruit came down with it. And so getting rid of the old nature means that the moral lifestyle will change also. And this is how Paul put it in Romans 6. 6, Our old self was crucified with Christ that our body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. See, the nature is dealt with so that the lifestyle is dealt with. But Paul reminds us there were two things that happened to us when we received Christ. The old us was put off, was killed, but the new us was created. Look at verse 10. You put off the old self with its practices, verse 10, and have put on the new self. Again, this word put on, when the scripture uses this Greek word to put on, it's often referring to garments, putting on clothes, putting on new layers. And this makes sense. If you've put something off, You've replaced it by putting something on. Now, what is the new self here? What's the new self? Well, it is the new creation in Christ. We were in and under Adam, our head, and were guilty by association. But now, Christians have moved positionally from we were Adam's offspring, and now we are new creatures under Christ. We are new positionally. And this is the taking off the imagery here, taking off of old clothes. It is the taking off of filthy clothes and exchanging it for righteous garments. Now, this is what we saw in the reading of Zechariah that that Micah brought us, isn't it? What what, what do we see in that vision that Zechariah has? uh, Joshua, the high priest, he's standing before God. And who's at his side? Satan. And what's Satan doing? Doing what he does best. He's accusing Joshua of all of his sins. And and the Lord rebukes Satan. And it says Joshua's left there standing. 
the high priest in filthy clothes. And then the Lord rebukes Satan and says, I have taken away your iniquity, Joshua. And then the call goes out, take off his filthy garments, put a new turban on his head, clothe him in pure vestments. He's changed. He's righteous. He's positionally now guiltless, clean before God. And this is a consistent gospel theme in the scriptures. What did Jesus say? Maybe he gives the parable of the wedding banquet and all the children of God are coming in. And what are they wearing? Wedding garments. And one sneaks in and comes into the kingdom and he's pulled up immediately. And he says, what are you doing in here with those clothes? How did you think you could get in here with your normal clothes? You're not wearing a wedding garment. Quickly bind up that man and cast him into outer darkness. He's still got the old garments on. And this is consistent. What do we see with the prodigal son? He spends his wealth, in the father's wealth, in licentious living, in immoral living. And where does he find himself when he's broke? He finds himself with the pigs. He's there in the mud and he's begging for the pig's food and he's filthy and he comes to his senses and he goes to the father and the father hugs him and the father embraces him and kisses him. And what's the first command that comes out of the father's mouth? Quick, servants, get him out of these filthy clothes. Grab the best robe, put on the ring and put shoes on his feet. Righteous garments. Clean forgiveness, righteousness before God is for all those who come to Christ. This is the theme. Christian, Christian, look into the mirror of God's word. Not with natural eyes, but with spiritual eyes. Look with faith. And when you look in the mirror, what do you see looking back? You see yourself clothed in white. You are radiant. You are pure in his sight. You are wearing the spotless, righteous garments of your groom. You are completely washed. All of your sins, the most horrific things you've ever committed, the things of the past, the things of the present, and even the sins of the future, all of them have been washed. Even in this very presence, in his sight, you're in your wedding garments. You are his bride. And you are clean whiter than snow. And there's a reason why the early church, church history, when Christians were baptized, the church gave them a white robe to be baptized in the waters. Why? What were they trying to do? They were trying to make visible an invisible reality. They were new now. And they were dressed in white before the Lord. See, you have put on the new self, and you are now positionally righteous in God's sight. But it goes more than that. We're not just new positionally, but we are new practically. And this is so important. Because he has done this work, we are now new in nature, the scripture says. And therefore, when the nature's changed, what have we seen? The fruit changes. At our first birth, we were descendants of Adam, born sinners with a corrupted nature. But what does the scripture say? But you were born again. You were born again. Now you are descendants of Christ. You've been born from above. You've been born by the Holy Spirit. And you have a new nature now. Now we receive in coming to Christ a new self, Paul says. And what is a new self? Well, the scripture just paints it in so many different beautiful layers. You get a new heart. Remember the heart that was deceitful above all things? You get a new one. He takes out the heart of stone that was so stiff and didn't respond to the call of God and he gives you a heart of flesh that listens and responds. And with the new heart comes new desires. Now, instead of wanting to oppose and defy him and be your Lord, you become joyfully submissive to the new master, and you desire holiness and righteousness. And now you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so you have a new guide, and you go by a new authority now, the Word of God, not your feelings, 
not popular opinion. And in you is created a new hatred. A hatred for sin and unrighteousness. See, this is a massive transformation. And it's huge. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. There is a new work. And it is a tragedy, but this, this massive transformation that the gospel speaks about, it's left out today in so much talking about salvation. It's left and pushed aside. It's, it's even considered not essential in Christianity. So, so someone can accept Jesus, receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and yet their life can be no different. In the same way as before, they have no desire to pray. They have no desire to sit and read and take in and obey His Word. They have no desire to live, to leave the the sin that was once holding them. No, 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 they stay in it. And they continue in it. And there is no ache for souls who are perishing just like they were perishing. Why is this? Why, Why has the church removed this cry that Jesus had to people? You must be born again. Why has it been removed? Because the church cannot manufacture transformation. We cannot produce that. In in all of our strategies, we cannot produce what only the Holy Spirit can. What can we manufacture? What can we produce? Well, we, we can produce decisions, can't we? While every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you want to take Jesus into your heart, just lift your hand. No one's looking. And, and if you repeat a prayer, if you say this prayer, and if you repeat it, I just want you to know that Jesus has come into your heart and all your sins are forgiven. We can, we can produce that. But no, 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 the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel makes people new. It takes something and someone that was opposed and indifferent to God and His will and it makes them lovingly follow Him, desire Him. Jesus says, it is the Holy Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. It is the power of the gospel that brings this newness and transformation. Let me quote Alexander McLaren. He talks about the newness. I mean, what the newness that comes with salvation. Listen how many times newness comes up. Let me quote him. All things will have become new. Because we move now as new creatures with new love burning in our hearts and new motives changing our lives and a new aim shining before us and a new hope illuminating the blackness beyond and a new song on our lips and a new power in our hands and a new friend by our side, Jesus. See, churches and systems cannot produce this This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is His work. It's His ministry and not ours. The Holy Spirit comes in power and He breaks a person. And He brings them to the end of themselves and He convicts them of sin and He shows them what they are and then He leads them. He doesn't leave them. He leads them up the mount and He leads them to Calvary. And he shows them how wonderful, how lovely, how needful is Jesus Christ. And the life of God comes in to the dead sinner. And Paul says, you have put on the new self. See, this is vitally important. And this is irreplaceable Christianity. Transformation. Transformation. See, Christianity does not invite people. Come and you need to make some changes. You need to make some modifications. You need to reform and sweep, sweep up some of the mess. You need to make some new resolutions and start making some good choices. No, 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 that's not Christianity. What is the call? Come and be made new. Come to living waters. Come to Jesus Christ. Come and exchange the old for new. Come and be born again. Come and receive life. The gospel promises life. Jesus promised life. What do you say? I have come to bring life so that they may have life and life abundant. 
and wicked false teachers will use that verse and say, Jesus wants you to have prosperity and wealth and health and success. That's not what Jesus is talking about. When he says, I've come to give you life and life abundant, he says, I've come to give you resurrected life and lift you out of your sin so that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. This is eternal life. This is the change that Christianity through the gospel brings. It's what unsaved adults and what children need. So I want you to picture a scenario. There is, picture a, a woman in the church and she has kids, but she's married to a non-Christian man. And then you come up to that non-Christian man who is not one of our number and you say to him, you really, you really should start your day with prayer. And you know what? At night time, you should be reading the Bible to your kids. That's wrong. That's not what he means. You are telling him to do something that he does not desire nor want. What does he need first? He needs life. He needs to be saved. He needs to know Jesus Christ and have his sins forgiven. Change the root and the fruit will be changed. This is what the gospel brings. And, and this extends further. Christian parent or grandparent or Sunday school teacher or youth leader or Christian educator. What we are communicating, we must communicate to the children more than just good behavior more than just Bible stories. Sometimes we get so excited when the children know the answers to the story about David and Goliath. But it must go further than that. We must be reinforcing and continually showing them how much they need a Savior. That they need forgiveness. That they need rescue. That they need the hope of Jesus Christ that they need to be made right with God. This is what they need. They need their sins forgiven. See, if our sons and our daughters and the next generation just grow up with being told, this is how you should live, this is what pleases God, and these are the Bible stories about Abraham, David, and the Apostle Paul, what will happen? They will grow up and they will meet other people who are lovely, wonderful, have positive outlook on life, who do good things in the world, but who aren't Christians. And what will they come to understand? Christianity is helpful, but not essential. They need to know they need saving. They need a savior. And we need to communicate this to them. Christianity makes people new. That's what the gospel does. That's our first point to a new person. Now, secondly, if you're taking notes, the new process, the new process. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, he says, we have put on the new self, which is being renewed. Now, this is, Strange language. When do you renew something? When it's expiring. When it becomes out of date, like a license or something. And Paul says, you've been made new and now you're being renewed. H how does that work? Well, the wording here, to be renewed, means to grow, to change, to continue. So putting on the new self happened in the past when we first believed in Christ. But here where it says you're being renewed, that's in the present tense. That's happening in the present. It's happening right now. It's happening as the word of God is getting in and into the bloodstream and working to the heart and the mind. You're being renewed. I'm being renewed. And what does this tell us? It tells us that though we've been made new, we still have progress to make. We still have moving forwards. There's still, everything is still moving towards consummation. Think about it, a newborn baby. When a baby is born, that is new life. But it's got a lot of growing to do. It's got a lot of maturing physically, mentally, emotionally, all of those things. So too for the Christian. As soon as we come to Christ, we are new. But we've got a lot of growing to do. A lot of stretching 
We are a work in progress. And this is what God's doing in us. Now, our growth, it may be slow, it may be rapid, and there might be times when it's both slow and then rapid, but there will always be growth. Why? This is in the present tense. You are being renewed. God will have it no other way. Philippians 1.6, I'm confident of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Now, it may be slow growth. It may be rapid growth. But just like the days on the calendar of the year, it will continually tick over. Some weeks go fast. Some go slow. But the weeks roll on. And so does our growth. Now, now what does the process of renewal involve? Look what he says in verse 10. You put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? You are being renewed in knowledge, unto knowledge here. This was Paul's prayer for the church. What did he say back at the beginning of the letter? We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is what God is doing. He is growing us in the knowledge of who he is. More and more. And, and this is, a, I, I think Christians and Christian movements can tend to be on the extremes. You can have the groups that are Bible believing and they're just all knowledge and they can give you every single answer. And then you probably, and there's no hard involvement there. And then you swing to the opposite extreme, which is probably where the 21st century majority is in the West. And what is it? You can have your knowledge. I want experience. I want to feel something. I want to come to church and I want there to be atmosphere. I want goosebumps. I want to be stirred. I want to be transported when it comes time to worship. You can have that knowledge stuff. And and there's these extremes. Paul says we are being renewed in knowledge. And knowledge comes through God's word. One of the most important verses that we are to know in the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, for correction and training in righteousness. The holy scriptures, as food is necessary for the physical body, the scriptures are necessary for our spiritual growth. Absolutely necessary. Peter says, like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up in your salvation. This is where the growth comes. Now notice, this is phenomenal. Notice where the whole renewal process, where it's leading to. Look look where we're heading, verse 10. You put on the new self, being renewed in knowledge, after the image of its creator. There is salvation consummated. That, that's the grand finished product. You are being renewed into the image of your creator. Now, now, what's God doing for us? Paul says, you need to go back to the garden. You need to go right back where God created the world and everything in it. Everything in it. And he saves man and woman last. And he makes them different to the rest, different to the, the beast. In Genesis 1.26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve, different to all the beasts of the earth. He makes them spiritual creatures, as well as physical creatures. And they know God. They're made in relationship with God. They walk with God in the garden and they talk with Him. And they were righteous. Made in His image. When God looked down at them, He saw some of His self in them. Looking back at Him, they were made in the image of God. Then the righteous were tempted. And the righteous were deceived. And then they sinned. And it's called the fall for a reason. And then everything changed. They went from righteous to completely unrighteous because the first child born on the planet becomes the first murderer. And he murders his brother at that. And then things just spiral out. You see that there's all of a sudden, there's this disease that's passing through Adam's line. And then you just get a few generations later and you get to Noah's generation. 
And now when God looks down from heaven at his image bearers, what does he see? Let me tell you what he says. Genesis 6, 5. This is what the Lord sees now. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. When God looked down upon his image bearers, now he saw next to nothing of himself. That image, that mirror that was supposed to reflect back at him, it was shattered and marred and defiled. What is God accomplishing in us? Even this day, Christian, what's he doing? He is renewing you back into his image. He is bringing you back to that, but he is doing something far greater in us than what he first did for Adam and Eve. Who is the perfect image of God? We saw in Colossians 1.15, Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. We see more of God than Adam and Eve saw because we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see more of his love and his grace than Adam and Eve ever knew. The perfection of the invisible God is Christ. We see him. And so God is renewing us into the image of Christ. What does it say in Romans 8.29? For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined. Why? To be conformed to the image of his Son. Because of Adam, because of sin, we became like Adam. Because of the cross, we're becoming like Jesus Christ. Because of the cross. And this is wonderful. This change of image. We looked nothing like God. We were looking more like Adam. And now we're looking like Christ. There's a wonderful verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. It says this, Just as we've borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is what he's doing in us. And so we're becoming less and less like Adam and more and more like Christ. You, you know when a baby's just born and you look at it and, and people will say things, oh my goodness, she looks like your mother. Or I can, see, I can see her father in her. Even just as it's just born. But then what happens as the baby grows and it starts developing, more and more of the likeness is seen. When we become a Christian, instantly we are so changed that there is a resemblance of Christ there. But as we are renewed more and more and as we grow, we are made more and more into his likeness. And when is the portrait complete and perfect? When is the mirror perfect? When? 1 John 3, 2. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The image of God fully restored. That's where we're heading. That's the new process. Lastly, in our remaining time, we see the new people. Look at the new people. The Holy Spirit now shows us that the new work of the gospel far exceeds God's works of old. Verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. Now, do you see that list? Paul gives us a very detailed list here, and he wants the reader just to ponder it for a second. You are looking at a people of opposites here. You are looking at a people who hate each other. You are looking at a list of incompatibles, massive incompatibles. We see in this list, we see racial division. We see cultural division. We see religious division. And we see social division. These are the walls, the dividing walls that had formed within humanity. And they are strong walls. They are mighty like the ancient walls of Troy. The hostility and division is staggering. Now, they deserve just a little bit of attention. Look at the first class there. The, the racial division, Greek and Jew. You know, it's hard to grasp how much the Jews and Gentiles hated each other. Jews wouldn't freely socialize and converse with Gentiles. They wouldn't enter a Gentile's home. They wouldn't even buy food that a Gentile butcher had prepared. And then you get to the temple, and even Gentiles who became believers in Yahweh, what did they make in the temple? It's called the court of the Gentiles. 
you guys stay outside. And then there's an inscription on the wall on the temple, and archaeologists have found it. You know what the inscription says that the Jews wrote? It says this. This is at the place of worship. Quote, No foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put blame for the death which will ensue. If you come in, you're dead. And it's your fault. Because no Gentile, no dirty Gentile comes within here. And guess what? You can be sure that the Gentiles reciprocated the feelings. It was mutual. They hated the Jews. Right-wing conservatives. Then you have there the second group, circumcised and uncircumcised. This is the religious divide. You have Jews who see Gentiles as an abomination because the Gentiles worship a million gods. And then you have the Gentiles looking at the Jews saying, how narrow-minded are these people and arrogant? They worship one God and said all, all the rest is a lie. And you have the Gentiles who hold to their mythology and you have the Jews who hold to their scriptures. And they hated each other. Look at the third group, barbarian and Scythian. Now they are contrasted with Greeks here, not with each other. Now barbar- barbarians, that term is, a use, is used by Greeks to denigrate and to mock people who were not Greek, who were uncivilized, whose language consisted of sounds and not articulate words. So the Greeks mocked them and called them bar bar barbarians. And it was a derogatory term. They saw them as uncivilized and inferior. But then you have the Scythians, and they made most barbarians look classy. These were the worst of the worst. They lived in what we see as modern Russia and to the lower parts of northern China. Now, the Scythians, they were considered the wildest of all barbarians. Now, they were considered the pinnacle of savages and they were infamous for their love of war. The Gentiles and Jews hated the Scythians, but they also feared them because they were a ruthless people. Let me quote one historian. He says this, The Scythians were the epitome of unrefinement and savagery. Scythians delight in murdering people and are little better than wild beasts. goes on. They ruled Asia for 28 years and the land was wasted by reason of their violence and their arrogance. The greater number of them were entertained and made drunk and were defeated eventually by the Medes. The Scythians drank the blood of the first enemy killed in battle and they made napkins of their scalps and drinking bowls of the skulls of the slain. And they had the most filthy habits and never washed with water. You can see why the educated Greeks and Gentiles hated them. And then last, you have the social divide, slave and free. Now, who can comprehend the gulf between slaves and masters, slaves and free people? Slaves were not even treated as human. Back in that time, not even as human. They were seen as nothing more than tools and instruments. That's what they were. They Forget about human rights. Often denied marriage. They were used. They were beaten. They were flogged. They were killed. And they were dumped. See, we we have markets here, food markets, and we have second-hand markets. What did they have? They had slave markets back then. They deemed them as nothing more than personal property. They bought and sold people like merchandise. And you look at this list. What a list of incompatibles, of immovable walls. And yet, what does the gospel do? What does it say at the very beginning of verse 11? Here. Here. In the new work of God, there is not Jew and Gentile. There's, there's no slave free, Scythian. None of that. The walls are gone. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church. But before he could build the church, he had to come in with demolition. And he had to level everything. And he had to bring it down. And just as the Lord brought the mighty walls of Jericho down, he brought those walls down. There's hostility. He comes in and he breaks it down so that he can build a far better temple.
can Solomon ever meet, a temple of living stones. It's incredible. When you read the letter of Colossians, it's made up of Jews, Gentiles, perhaps Scythians, slaves and free people. And how does Paul introduce them at the beginning of his letter? He says in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters at Colossae. They're made, they're made family. Now, how on earth do you make such incompatibles family? How do you bring them into one family? What is the answer? Look at the last line. What does he say? But Christ is all and in all. Christ, he comes in. He reveals humanity's greatest need and he comes as the cure. And he bridges the gap. You see, everyone has need of Calvary. Everyone has need of a saviour. Everyone has need for the stone to be rolled away on the third day. All those people, everyone in this room is saved by one and the same gospel. Jesus Christ come into the world to save sinners. Now, can you imagine in the first century church on a Sunday gathering? Can you imagine communion? Scythian, slave, Gentile and Jew breaking bread together. Breaking bread, eating together. This is what the gospel does. This is the transformation and the change. So if we were to take a survey around the churches today and you were to give everyone a piece of paper and you say to them, what makes Christianity distinct from all the other religions? Would the church say the gospel transforms people? That's what makes it distinct. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that the old has been put away and that the new has come. We thank you that you save sinners. We thank you that you rescue. We thank you that we are delivered from the power of sin. God, we thank you for everything that awaits us. We thank you as we sang earlier that we shall feast in the new Zion. And Lord, this room, each of us, we are such different people, but you have made us one family and there shall be one flock under one shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in that and we proclaim him who is head of creation and head of the church. And we thank you that Christ dwells not simply in the elders or the deacons, but Christ is all and in all. And in that we rejoice. We give thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with a song together, praising and rejoicing in our God.